Okay, so there are seven key things you need to know when doing audiovisual analysis. And there are a couple of things you've got to sort out before you begin. So the things that you want to think about before you start actually writing are audience, purpose, and context. The reason why these are important is because the types of pieces you'll be looking at, usually interviews or speeches, are designed for a very, very specific audience. So unlike the typical articles you get in argument analysis, where it'll be some kind of editorial or opinion piece or blog post, which is very much designed for a broad audience, like you know anyone who comes across it on the internet or anyone who reads this particular newspaper, Speeches are very, very different. They're designed for particular groups, usually a group of some people from a certain profession or parents, teachers, even students sometimes. So it's much more niche. One of the things you can do to really boost your grade in argument analysis in general is to talk about how certain techniques affect certain groups of the audience. So you can segment your audience into different groups, people of various backgrounds or various interests. That is something you have to do 100% with audiovisual analysis because in speeches, everything is tailored to a particular audience. When you've got an audience of people who are listening to you live, you have to keep their attention much more than a static audience who's just reading a newspaper, for example. So you really need to think about that. And then just as you would normally for standard argument analysis, you also want to think about the purpose and the context. So what is the thing that the author is trying to get people to think or change their behavior about? And what is the context that they're doing it in? So have there been any particular changes in the world, in their local area or in society that have made this a relevant topic? So these are the first couple of things I would get you to think about. Then after that, in terms of audiovisual techniques, there are seven main things you want to think about and then a couple of bonus ones. So if you can think of any, feel free to pop them in the chat, but in the interim, I'll just jot down some of the key ones that I want you guys to know. So the first one is stress or emphasis. So this is really important for a couple of reasons. First thing stress or emphasis does is it draws attention to a part of the phrase. So that can be used to make it more memorable or to make it easier for an audience to see what's important in what the author is actually saying. But the second thing it can do is sometimes emphasis on a word can change the meaning or indicate sarcasm a little bit. So that's another thing to keep in mind, particularly if someone's got a very biting or sarcastic tone. The second thing you want to look at is volume. So does the person speak in a loud voice or do they speak in a more quiet voice? Generally, if someone's speaking loudly, that conveys passion, anger, some kind of other emotion, or it can be used to draw attention to a point. The other reason someone might speak loudly is if they're trying to convey urgency or emphasis. So if they've really gotten to the key part of their argument, and they want you to focus on that, they might be a little bit louder, a little bit emphatic. And often it goes with a faster pace as well. On the other hand, sometimes being quiet can be equally effective because it draws the reader in to listen a little bit more closely than they otherwise might. And it adds a sense of seriousness and intimacy to the interaction as well. So those are the two ways I would probably analyze changes in volume. But the most important thing to note is not so much is it loud or is it quiet? But how does it change to match the current argument that we're up to? So has this person shifted to something they care more about and they're more loud about? Or have they been loud through the entire time and now they're saying the one thing they want you to remember very softly? So stress, emphasis is the first thing you need to know. Volume is the second. The third thing that it's good to have an eye on is the pace or the tempo of a piece. And again, this is really important, similarly for reasons to volume. So if someone is speaking very quickly, or if they're speaking, you know, often that goes with being loud, but not always, 
Generally, if they're speaking quickly, that suggests some degree of urgency or possibly glossing over the details. So often people will speak a rebuttal a little bit quicker than the rest of their speech, just because they don't want to give too much airtime to the opposition's argument. So that's one thing to note. On the other hand, if someone speaks very slowly, generally that will be to put emphasis on each word, or it'll be used to add a sense of gravitas or importance. The other thing that speaking slowly can do is it can give a sense of confidence to the speaker. Generally, people tend to speak more quickly and in a slightly more panicked way if they're uncomfortable. If they're speaking slowly and in a measured way where they emphasize each word, it tends to feel a little bit more planned and a little bit more confident. So this is another way of building that kind of credibility or trustworthiness with the audience. Whereas this is a good way to focus on the importance of what you're saying. So that's number three. Number four, uh, a very important one, is pitch or intonation. So pitch is mostly important when it comes to where the sentence ends. So a sentence can end on a high pitch or it can end on a low pitch. If it ends, on a high pitch, generally what this implies about this idea that the author has just given is that they're uh, questioning and they're genuinely trying to engage with the audience. So I just went through one piece with a student today where the author said, or the speaker gave two rhetorical questions one straight after the other. And the first one, they ended on a high pitch because they were questioning, genuinely asking it, actually wanted the audience to interrogate the question and consider what it meant for themselves. But then the second question was almost like an answer to the first one. So they said, should we be doing, should we be doing A or B? Or should we be actually doing option C? And they ended with a lower pitch at the end to kind of suggest a level of certainty. So if someone has a high pitch at the end of a sentence, usually a rhetorical question, shows that they're questioning, genuinely trying to engage with the audience, or perhaps there's a degree of uncertainty, or perhaps they're listing. On the flip side, if they end with a low pitch, again, gravitas, certainty, importance, or some answer to something that they've just given. So those are the first four things that are really important. The next three, we won't go into so much detail because the variety of things you could have is quite broad, but I'll just list them out anyway. So the first one is rhythm. This one isn't too important in the sense that People don't often speak with a very deliberate rhythm the whole way through, perhaps unless they're saying a poem or something. But it might turn up in the context of putting emphasis on something. So a good example I had was a student was looking at a speech the other day where the speaker was saying, do students really need to know how to write a rigorously structured essay? And the hand gestures like this combined with the staccato rhythm of her saying rigorously structured essay was in such juxtaposition from what she'd previously said that it, it really added to the emphasis of how much what students are taught is very rigorous, structured, box-like. There's no sort of creativity in it. So rhythm won't really turn up unless you have a particularly staccato section, which is designed to add emphasis to a piece. The sixth thing you need to know is pause. So we won't go into that in detail because generally an author just puts a pause in order to add more emphasis to what they've said and to get the audience to think about it a little bit deeper. And the most important one which is saved for last, is tone or voice. 
And I'm not going to add any detail for this because there are so many different tones that it really is quite specific to the actual piece that you're looking at. But that is a really important thing to know. So before you get started, you want to consider audience, purpose and context. And then as you're listening, you want to consider these seven things. So stress or emphasis, volume, pace and tempo, pitch and intonation, rhythm, pause and tone. And if you're able to pull out two or three of those things per body paragraph that you have to write in your sack, you'll be doing pretty well. I think that's all you really need to do to tick the box for audio analysis. And then the rest of your piece can just be bulked up with traditional analysis of persuasive techniques. There are two caveats I would maybe add to this. Some schools recommend that you also analyze noise or sound effects which can include things like background noise or even audience reactions. So if the audience starts laughing at something the author has said, you can comment on that, um, especially if your teacher recommends that you do, because that kind of helps you show the interplay between the speaker and the audience. So that's one thing you can do. Background noise, I probably wouldn't worry about too much, but if there are particular sound effects, because you've been asked to analyze a video, for example, and it's got music added to it or something like that, that can be helpful as well. The last thing I want to note is that when you analyze all these things, it's slightly different from traditional argument analysis in that you don't just want to talk about these effects by themselves. You have to talk about how these audio techniques interplay with the actual words that they're said over. So stress or emphasis by itself doesn't mean anything. But if someone says, for example, uh, he loves me, say, that by itself is a rather bland sentence. But by saying he loves me, that's very different to he loves me. You kind of get the sense that there's two different stories in both of those lines. So the stress and emphasis by itself doesn't mean anything, but the words that it is placed over does. So when you do the actual analysis, you don't just want to be thinking about the standard DQA structure. So what device or what audio technique is it? Um, obviously you can't quote it. You have to just describe it. And then when you talk about the effect, it has to be in conjunction with the words it is said over. So your analysis itself is going to be worded slightly differently and you do want to have a focus on the combination of things. So it's a little bit trickier than standard analysis because you have to balance both the effect and how it works with other techniques, but definitely doable. So consider these, take notes on these as you're listening through. Consider noise and sound effects if you've been given an edited video. And make sure that when you write your effect, you say what words it's in conjunction with and what the effect of that is, how it serves to amplify those words or those techniques.